Okay. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm Karen Hampanda. I'm with the University of Colorado. And today we're going to be talking about post HIV exposure prophylaxis, what you need to know. Um, Maida, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Sure. So my name is Maida Gudavali, and I am working with Karen at Dr. Hampanda um, in the Department of OBGYN. Um, and I've been a staff member at CCASA, and I'm really excited to be back to talk a little bit more about um, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. Thank you. Um, and I am a, a PhD researcher, so my background is mostly in research and looking at the intersection of violence and HIV um, is, is what my background is. So the objectives for today are to develop an awareness of the intersection of HIV and sexual assault, to be informed about the use of PEP, which is the HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, understand some of the barriers that survivors may experience obtaining PEP, gain knowledge about how to navigate some of those barriers, including the cost of the medications, and hopefully leave you with tools for advocacy. Just a little bit of background on HIV. HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, this is a virus that attacks the immune system. It is not curable, but it is treatable. If untreated, however, it can lead to AIDS, which can be a life-threatening condition. There are about 1.1 million people in the United States that are living with HIV. The map over here shows you um, the prevalence, which is how many people are living with HIV out of the total population. So um, the light blue is the lowest. Um, and then as it gets darker, those are the states that have more um, in a higher proportion of individuals that are living with HIV. The current rate is about 418 people per 100,000 are on average living with HIV in the United States. And um, in the U.S., there are certain groups that have a higher risk of contracting HIV, um, and those are particularly individuals who use injection drugs and men who have sex with other men. So I wanted to go over just a little bit about HIV risk and the type of risk that somebody might encounter during an assault. Um, so any penetration of the vagina or anus by a penis from somebody who has HIV or through contact with somebody who's living with HIV's infected blood can transmit HIV, although the risk per encounter does vary. There is a lower risk, a much lower risk of um, potential infection through oral sex. And one of the big risk factors that could increase somebody's risk through either consensual or non-consensual sex would be the presence of a, another sexually transmitted infection or genital lesions if either the victim or the perpetrator has an STI or genital lesions and HIV, the risk of transmission is increased. When talking about sex acts, um, the reason that men who have sex with other men have such high HIV prevalence compared to others is that receptive anal intercourse is the highest risk for sexual transmission of HIV. So the table over here shows you um, the approximate risk per act. And this is based on um, consensual sex. Uh, so receptive anal intercourse you can see is the highest there where it would be expected that one per 72 individuals engaging in anal receptive intercourse would contract HIV compared to receptive vaginal intercourse, which is one per 1,250. Insertive anal intercourse is a little bit higher at one per nine, uh, 909. Uh, insertive vaginal intercourse is quite low risk with one per 250,000. And then um, oral sex, which we'll talk about, there could be some instances that it could increase risk, but the risk is um, almost minuscule with, with oral sex under normal situations. 
So thinking about this intersection of HIV and violence, um, there's been quite a lot of evidence that globally and in the United States, um, unfortunately, most of the data, just a disclaimer, comes from cisgender heterosexual individuals. So I will say that as a caveat um, to a lot of these statistics, unfortunately, that's the data that we have. Um, but what we do know is that women who have experienced violence, um, be this intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence, have higher rates of HIV. So women who have a history of abuse are more likely to experience an STI, including HIV. And it's estimated that women who have been exposed to physical and sexual violence are over three times more likely to be living with HIV than individuals who have not experienced such violence. One of the reasons for this is that men uh, who engage in violence tend to have greater risk factors for STI and HIV infection. So it's been established that men who rape or are physically violent with their partners tend to have more sexual partners on average, engage in more unprotected sex, including coerced unprotected sex, and are more likely to engage in harmful substance use, which are risk factors for HIV and other STIs. Um, and uh, uh, men who also engage in this violence are statistically more likely to have HIV or another STI. We also know that certain risk groups experience both high levels of um, violence and HIV. So drug-involved women um, are much more likely to be living with HIV and also experience higher levels of abuse and more severe abuse. Women that are involved in the sex industry, including those that may be trafficked for sexual exploitation, also have increased risk of HIV and experience increased risk of violence potentially from clients, pimps, or police. And all of this combined significantly uh, increases somebody's risk of contracting an STI, including HIV. So some of the reasons that sexual assault in particular could increase somebody's risk of HIV compared to consensual sexual intercourse is that there may be broken skin or abrasions and lacerations to the vagina or particularly to the anus or the rectum. And if those are, if there are those type of injuries, this increases the risk of HIV because it's more likely then that there will be bodily fluid transmission um, and exposure to HIV if the assailant has HIV. Um, we also know that object penetration is common during sexual assaults. Um, so this can lead to additional injuries. And if that's filed by penile insertion with ejaculation, again, this heightens the risk of HIV. Um, if an individual were um, hurt uh, in their face or beaten prior to ingestion of oral fluids, um, this could then in increase the risk of HIV transmission as well. So I talked about how oral sex is generally very low risk, although if someone has cuts or is bleeding or has sores in their mouth, um, they then could experience a higher risk of HIV if they were exposed to the bodily fluids of somebody living with HIV. Um, another reason is that through assault, we know that often, um, anal sex occurs. So these individuals may not typically be engaging in anal sex, but experience this in the course of their assault, which um, it's estimated that 10 to 15% of reported sexual assaults do include unprotective receptive anal intercourse. So again, this dramatically heightens somebody's risk of potential um, exposure and transmission to HIV through something that they would maybe typically not be engaging in. Um, the other things that could happen during an assault that are significantly associated with increased HIV risk is if there are multiple assailants and exposure to uh, multiple individuals, 
body fluids. Um, if the survivor is a uh, prepubertal and a child, this is, ex this is associated with risk, um, including the types of assault that children typically experience, which tend to be more repetitive, as well as uh, biologically, they are more vulnerable to um, risk of HIV. And then if the assailant is an injection drug user or engages in sex, um, is a man who engages in sex with other men. So before we get into the risks and rights, are there any questions about the HIV epidemiology and what we know in terms of HIV risk in the United States? This is Sierra. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but I will keep an eye out and feel free to share your questions or comments, everyone, and I will be on the lookout. Yeah, so we will we'll take time at the end, but we'll also be pausing periodically. So if something comes up that you need clarification for um, or have any questions on, please feel free to put that in the chat immediately and we'll try to respond to it in real time. Karen, um, oh, yes. There are some questions in the chat. Um, someone asks, what do you mean by receptive versus insertive? Yeah, absolutely. So going back here, receptive anal intercourse would be the individual who is having a object or penis inserted into their anus. Receptive would be the individual with the phallus, with the penis that is doing the insertion. Does that clarify? Can you say that one more time? Yes. So receptive would be the individual whose anus is being penetrated or whose vagina is being penetrated by a penis or other object. So that is the individual who is having something inserted into their body or receiving the sex act, as opposed to the insertive is the person who has the penis that is going into the individual receiving the sex act. So if you think about it in terms of top versus bottom, receptive would be the bottom receiver and insertive would be what the top. Did that clarify? So the reason that receptive is more likely to be at risk is because that is the individual who is going to have potentially ejaculation and semen entering their body, which then leads to a situation where that bodily fluid is inside the individual's body the sex act also can create trauma around the vagina or the anus, which then creates an opportunity for HIV to enter inside the body, as opposed to the individual with the penis who is inserting it. Their risk is much lower because they are potentially exposed to some bodily fluids, but not as much as the person who is the receiver and having bodily fluids actually ejaculated inside of them. And the other questions for pre-ejaculation, um, that also is considered bodily fluid and has the potential to transmit HIV. Children are generally at greater risk because they don't have as much estrogen, um, which makes the tissue in the genital area more susceptible to injury. Any other questions or clarifications there? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I honestly struggled with how to present this material in a way that was accurate, but that also gave you a sense of how serious the problem is. So, um, the good news is for most individuals that 
the risk of getting HIV from a sexual assault in the United States is extremely low. So we talked about those statistics where less than 1% of the population are living with HIV. And in order for somebody who has experienced an assault to contract HIV, the assailant needs to be infected with HIV and have HIV. And even if the assailant has HIV, the risk of that being transmitted during a sexual assault is less than 3%. However, the bad news is that any sexual act, particularly a sexual assault, can result in HIV transmission, even though the risk is extremely low. And there have been instances where someone has contracted HIV, which is referred to here as HIV seroconversion. So this has occurred among individuals whose only known risk factor was the experience of sexual assault or sexual abuse. So the risk is extremely low, but it can happen. And often individuals who have experienced a sexual assault, this is something that they are really, really concerned about. So not only are they dealing with the trauma and the aftermath of this, they could potentially be living with uh, chronic lifelong disease that they then have to manage um, as a result of the assault. So survivors have a right to know about appropriate HIV testing that should happen and how to protect themselves if they think that they might be at risk, which is what we'll talk about today, HIV prophylaxis or PEP. Um, one of the things to be aware of is, unfortunately, HIV is not detectable on tests for at least four to six weeks after an infection. So if somebody experienced a sexual assault and went to the hospital within a few days, they want to test for HIV to determine if there was a prior HIV infection, in which case PEP would not be appropriate. However, even if somebody tests negative at that instance, it's recommended that they had need to have follow-up tests because confirmation that HIV um, infection did not occur is really only going to be possible with six months follow-up of that individual to confirm that you are still HIV negative and did not contract HIV. So accurate information about the risk and transmission of HIV is another right survivors have. And then um, access to survivor-focused services, which include follow-up monitoring for HIV. A little bit about some of these um, acronyms that we've been throwing out and these different drugs. So there is PrEP, PEP, and NPEP that we are going to be talking about today. Um, these are all medicines, medication, drug, tablets that you will take orally um, that can decrease the risk of acquiring HIV. However, when you take them and why you would take them differs. So PrEP with an R stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is a drug that somebody who thinks they might be at risk for HIV would take prior to having an exposure to HIV. So individuals um, who are high risk, such as men who have sex with other men, may take PrEP um, because they know that they are high risk. And if they are then exposed to HIV while they've been taking this daily drug, their risk of HIV is dramatically reduced. PEP, on the other hand, stands for post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is after somebody has potentially been exposed. Um, and PEP is offered often in healthcare settings for occupational exposure. If you're giving an injection to somebody who is a patient living with HIV and you accidentally stick yourself with that needle or um, there's a needle lying around and you get an accidental needle stick and you're not sure if there was an exposure. So PEP is often offered in that type of setting. But then there is also what's called non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. And this would be the case for somebody who's experienced a sexual assault, where there could be potentially exposure that happened outside of the occupational setting. 
and um, post-exposure prophylaxis could be potentially appropriate to serve as HIV prevention. The one important thing to know about this though, is that for it to be effective, it needs to be started within 72 hours. So unfortunately, if somebody has experienced sexual assault and they come into the hospital four days later, it is, it, 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 PEP would not be offered at that point because it would not be effective. So it needs to be started within 72 hours of the exposure. And the sooner that it is started, the more effective it is. So if we are concerned that somebody has potentially been exposed to HIV, this should be very high priority of getting them started on PEP as soon as possible, because the quicker it's started, uh, the more effective it will be. And then it needs to be taken daily for 28 days to also maximize effectiveness. So some of the considerations for NPEP um, that can make things a little bit difficult to assess is um, what type of sexual contact occurred. And often individuals may not recall. So it's estimated that up to about a third of patients don't recall what area was potentially exposed during the assault. Um, another question would be, were mucosal surfaces involved? So that would be penetration into the vagina, penetration into the anus. Um, again, people may not exactly recall, so it's difficult to assess risk. Um, pubertal status of the patient, we will know that. The other questions are, was the assailant known to the patient? And if so, are they an injection drug user? Do they have sex with other men? Often, I'm assuming the questions to this would be unknown. Similarly, is the assailant known to be infected with HIV or will they agree to be tested for HIV? And again, Often these are unknown. So it's really difficult to assess someone's actual level of risk. And if in doubt, uh, NPEP is likely going to be appropriate and help ease somebody's worries about contracting HIV, considering that a lot of this information may not be known. This is a table to, if you have all of the details, be able to assess whether someone has very low risk of HIV up to low to moderate risk of HIV. But again, as we mentioned, these may be details that are not going to be known. So I'm assuming in a lot of cases, it's going to be erring on the side of safety because we're not going to be sure whether or not the assailant has HIV. We're not going to be entirely sure what area of the body was penetrated and if there was exposure to bodily fluids and the risk behaviors of the assailant, et cetera. Um, but you will have this chart if it is of interest, which is um, to help healthcare providers have some decision-making aid to decide whether or not someone is at low versus moderate risk for PEP. Um, the efficacy of PEP is uh, thought to be very high if, if people adhere to that 28-day regimen. So among healthcare workers, uh, there was a study that found that there was an 81% reduction in risk after taking PEP and being exposed to HIV-infected blood. Other observational studies um, down here, not specifically uh, sexual assault, but men who have sex with men, uh, of 15, over, over, over 1,500 men, there were 48 seroconversions. Um, there was a study that looked at sexually assaulted children and over 8,000 children, 672 were offered PEP, 472 started PEP, 126 completed the 28-day course, and there were no zero conversions reported. Um, we don't know what people's actual exposure was, however, here, but we do know that if there was an exposure, um, PEP worked effectively. And then among mixed adults populations, uh, in, a, in a population of over 2,000 patients, there were 19 uh, who contracted HIV who were using PEP. 18 were due to poor adherence, however, uh, 
initiation greater than 72 hours or ongoing risk behavior. So based on these studies, basically we can say that PEP is effective at reducing the risk of HIV um, and is an important intervention for somebody that has been potentially exposed. Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay, so a, a few things to keep in mind in terms of maximizing effectiveness with PEP is um, we have really good drugs that are available now. So um, over the past several decades, uh, HIV drugs have really come a far way. And so we have three drug regimens that are going to be the most effective at protecting somebody. Important that they are initiated within 72 hours. And again, to reiterate, the sooner the better, somebody starting PEP. Um, and it's really important to try to maximize adherence across the 28-day course. So if somebody takes their pill every day across those 28 days, their risk of HIV is going to be extremely low. But the more doses that they miss, the less effective this drug is going to be. And some of the ways that we can maximize people's adherence is either giving them the full 28-day course when they are at the hospital or at least a seven-day starter pack, um, which Maida will talk about a little bit later on. All right. Thank you. Maida, do you want to share your screen or do you want to go with mine? I, you know, I will um, go with yours for now, just to maximize um, time. So I wanted to give you guys um, some information just so that if a client is coming to you, um, you have some basic knowledge of what they're encountering. Um, I think Dr. Kampanda did a wonderful job explaining the background of HIV and some of the drugs. Um, here are some of the names. So it, according to um, up to date and some of the like authorities on um, on HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, Truvada and Tivike are recommended. And you might be thinking, hmm, that's two drugs. Didn't we say the three drug regimen was the best? It is actually three drugs. So if you look down at the generic names, you can see all of these, what looks like an alphabet soup. Um, but essentially what we're seeing here is Truvada having multiple drugs in one pill and Tivike having that extra one drug. Um, if the patient is pregnant, um, Truvada and Acentris will be used instead um, because Tivike can cause um, defects in, in, uh, in the pregnancy. So Children's um, Hospital uses Bictarvi. So again, multiple drugs included in that one pill. The great thing about Bictarvi is that it's one pill a day. So Truvada and Tivike, it's going to be two pills a day. And Truvada and Isentris, it's actually going to be three pills. So they take Truvada and Isentris, and then they'll take Isentris again. Um, we like minimizing the amount of times someone is taking the pill. We know that it in populations that are not um, that are not sexually assaulted, that it increases its adherence. But in populations that have been sexually assaulted, um, it's less trauma. We're not reminding someone every time that they take the pill that this happened to them. Um, so moving towards less pills is definitely best practice. But there's barriers um, related to the doctor at hand and who is prescribing, which I'll go over later. Um, these are other names of other drugs and regimens. To my knowledge, they're not used in Colorado, um, but they're here just in case you're interested. Um, we also created an infographic for you guys that has common side effects um, and the manufacturer's name and their information if you need to get assistance um, paying for that. And we'll go over it in detail. The link to the infographic is above so that you can click on the links. Great, so barriers to obtaining PEP. Um, 
we surveyed a bunch of forensic nurse examiners as well as advocates. And um, I just wanted to share the results of that survey. It mirrors what we already know in the data. Um, but here in Colorado, we had good representation 50-50 in terms of urban versus rural, um, a bunch of representation from Centura Health and UC Health, which tend to be the dominant um, health systems in our state. In terms of the advocacy survey, um, we actually had a lot of advocates who serve rural areas um, respond. Most of those people interacted with UC Health and the Centura Health System, and um, advocates were seeing clients, around three clients every five months that um, were related to PEP. So this is something that comes up. Um, and what we're seeing here is that there is a wide variety of what's being prescribed, um, oh, pardon me, what's being dispensed at the pharmacy. So ideally, like Karen, like Dr. Hampanda mentioned earlier, the full course or the first seven days would be the most ideal, but we're only seeing that 37.5% of people who responded um, are seeing the full course being dis dispensed. Um, and we're seeing some areas where no pills are dispensed at the time, um, which definitely is a barrier for people experiencing violence to complete that pack. Um, most, so 37.5% of SANES, um, forensic nurse examiners, said that clients have difficulty accessing PEP. Um, so it's, the pharmacy not carrying PEP, um, it's the cost of the drug, whether that's for the pharmacy or the hospital system to absorb or the client to absorb, and also shipping delays. So in like many of you guys know, if I send in these clothes, there's no such thing as overnight shipping. It's whenever I send these open again. Um, so we're lucky in the Denver metro area, but in further out places um, where we need the drug to be shipped, we can see delays. Um, advocates said that cost more than anything was a barrier to accessing PEP. And there's... Um, there's some concerns over the explanation of benefits and how that would show up um, in an insurance report and if others would find out. So where are people getting their prescriptions filled? Um, forensic nurse examiners most commonly said the emergency department um, and advocates were saying that clients were getting their things filled at the hospital pharmacy or a private pharmacy. And how are clients paying for PEP? So by far between SANES and advocates, it's personal insurance. Um, so that is problematic. Um, personal insurance means that um, there may be a copay, the explanation of benefits and the um, concerns for confidentiality. Um, there are other there are other methods of payment, um, but they can be cumbersome or time consuming. Um, and this is what leads to a lot of clients just not choosing not to do um, the full course. And we want clients to be empowered to make the choice that's right for them and not be limited by cost um, or just the inconvenience of getting this medication filled. So helping clients access NPEP, what we've been doing is creating a spreadsheet, which is linkable right over here with the name of the location, the name of the same program, the pharmacy that is usually used, and how people are paying for it with a link to how to help clients get better payment. Um, and also some follow-up. So like Dr. Hampanda mentioned earlier, there needs to be continued monitoring up to six months. Um, so that's that's what this is. And hopefully if someone calls, um, there is the ability to look up where they went and have more information. So navigating costs, um, uh, it's expensive. 
it's super, super expensive. So figuring out the cost, I just used GoodRx and looked at King Supers. And it looks like the out-of-pocket cost for Truvada and Tidike, which is the most um, prescribed regimen in our state, is going to be $2,242. Um, and that's, that's, that's wild. And I know that if I went to a pharmacy and got handed that bill, I'd say, no, thank you. Um, and it compounds the trauma. Speaking with other forensic nurse examiners who deal with this on a daily, if not week, like all the time, it's compounding the trauma because you may have to choose between rent, food, or paying for this drug. Um, and this is not a situation that we want to put people who've experienced violence in. Um, the other regimens here are comparable in cost, but it is definitely very expensive. So there are options for payment. Um, I created a decision tree trying to help folks figure out like, where, where do we go? How do we navigate this? Um, so first thing to figure out, does the client have insurance? If they do have insurance and they have Medicaid, Medicare, great news they're usually fully covered. The copay might be like $3. Um, if they have private insurance, it'll be run through pri private insurance. There probably will be a copay. Sometimes there isn't. But if there is a copay, there are drug, the people who manufacture or create these drugs have assistance programs. Um, so I included the links to access these assistance programs. A lot of them can be done online. Um, some of them require them to be over the phone. If the client does not have insurance, same thing. The drug manufacturers um, have some assistance. This isn't foolproof. Sometimes drug manufacturers will look at their overall salary, how much income they're earning per year and say they can afford this, which is, I don't like it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't like that. Um, so if there is still a cost, there are some other resources that can be accessed. Um, so Colorado Health Network has some offices around the state. Um, and Austin Car Carlson is the contact there to see, to try to even further help navigate. Um, if clients are pursuing a law enforcement case, um, victims comp can be used, crime victims compensation, and sometimes nonprofit organizations can cover the cost. And I included the link to the nonprofit organizations um, that are patient assistance programs that can do that. Um, this is, again, a link for drug company assistance, just in case you wanted it presented to you in this way instead of a cost decision tree. Um, as you can see, they're not always open. Uh, usually people are coming to get an exam Friday night, so they'll have to wait till Monday morning to access to access all of these. Some programs do dispense one pill, um, and that can be problematic if it's a weekend or a holiday. Um, just a disclaimer, this only works if the pharmacy dispenses a brand name. So the drug manufacturer only manufactures their for me, like their specific pill. So if they're prescribed the generic form, which I believe Truvada has, um, Gilead is not going to cover the cost. So helping clients complete the 28 days of MPEP. Um, yes. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Um, we do have some direct questions, and I think you covered some of them. Um, but what is accessibility for minors, and do parents need to consent? Yeah, so um, it depends. Honestly, facility-wise, it's going to be different. So at Children's Hospital, there are policies in place to, um, if they're under if they're under 18, if they're a minor, that is a mandatory report. Um, so law enforcement will be involved. Um, there can be some considerations for confidentiality, which I think forensic nurse examiners do the best that they can. But I'd have to check with them to see what is 
the consent regards to parents. Um, Dr. Campana, do you have any thoughts or knowledge around that? I do not. Again, like Mina was saying, it will be, I think, institution specific. Um, and I would assume likely a lot of places you will need parental consent. Um, but yeah, it would be institution specific. And we can look into Children's Hospital in terms of what their policies are. As Maida mentioned, there are drugs available for pediatric patients and Children's Hospital has policies in place to administer those. Um, but whether or not like a teenager could walk in and access them without parental support, unfortunately, I'm not I'm not sure about that. Um, Christine, who is such an expert in this, um, who's a forensic nurse examiner from UC Health, um, educated us that all penetrating trauma is a mandatory report regardless of age. Um, so the next question, we can get back to, to folks on that specific one. It's a wonderful question. Um, how are drugs dispensed reliably to the homeless? Great question. We don't know. If you can leave with a 28 day pack, that's great. Um, and have follow up at some sort of clinic. And there are a few programs that do dispense the 28 days, um, like in that spreadsheet. So there is Denver Health, there is UC Health. Um, but unfortunately, if you are without housing, it creates additional complications. Um, a lot of prescribers want to make sure that they can monitor the person. These drugs do have side effects. Um, they can be toxic to the liver, toxic to the kidney, um, and we want to be able to draw labs and monitor these patients to make sure that they're okay. Um, so it's, it, it is, there is not a way to make sure that they're dispensed reliably. Um, that's my answer to that. And then I think Becky put in, it was mentioned it takes six months for HIV to show up. Do we know when the offender would have to submit to testing per statute? I think that's statute. Um, wondering if offender tests negative at the time, but then four months later would test positive. Do we have a way to capture that? Good question. Um, I'm not, I am not sure. It can take up to six months, um, but it can show up in the four to six week range. So um, if the person um, who is committing the violence um, submits to an HIV test, you're right, it could, it could not show up at that point. Um, I think I would have to look at our legal experts or nod to them in terms of what's best practice um, for testing an HIV. Um, I would assume that if we really wanted to know, it'd be similar like baseline, four to six weeks, three months and six months, but I don't know if that, what the legal um, feasibility of that is. Great, so side effects and tolerability. Um, typically these drugs are well tolerated, but there are some side effects. Um, fatigue, bad dreams, difficulty falling asleep, headache, a lot of abdominal issues. Um, but again, these, it's not that these are always occurring, these can occur. And what I wanted to point out is that these overlap with an acute stress reaction after trauma. So it could be the drug, but it could also be the not being able to sleep because something really bad just happened, having a headache, feeling nauseous from anxiety. Um, and this is important to know in counseling patients, and I'll go over that later. or maybe now. So um, what tools we have as advocates um, is if someone, if, if you're managing someone's case, if someone's calling, asking if they have, if they're having any difficulty with their med medications, normalizing some of the symptoms, saying like, yeah, that's been reported that people have difficulty falling asleep. And sometimes it can also be due to just having this bad thing happen, happening. Um, it's really normal to feel the way that you're feeling, and I'm sorry you're feeling that way. Um, and then offering some coping tools. Uh, so I, I put a like script here that you could, I mean, everyone here is um, very well versed, but just 
again, those symptoms sound really hard, validating it, saying it's a normal response to trauma, and then maybe giving them tools like square breathing or five senses um, to help them complete that course and stay on the course um, if that is what they want. Um, help logistically problem solve. Are they having trouble getting to their follow-up appointments? Um, are they nervous to fill out the mountain of forms that doctors usually have patients fill out? Is there a way to do that together um, to try to lessen the burden? So specifically for case management, it is supporting victims with follow-up, um, establishing and making collateral support services like transportation available to victims, like I mentioned before. And then it would be amazing if there was a referral network that we could access that if I know that a lot of people do this already, but develop relationships with people in the community at hospitals and create these understandings of I'm going to send someone here um, and know that they're going to get trauma informed care that upholds dignity, confidentiality, et cetera. Um, for hospital advocates, SANES, law enforcement, working with people to develop a follow-up plan before they leave the hospital. I think a lot of the forensic nurse examiners do this anyways, but sometimes it just goes over your head. Sometimes people really listen and um, are able to be present and absorb that information, but sometimes trauma doesn't allow that. So having being able to say the infectious disease people are going to call you and if they forget or haven't absorbed that information someone from infectious disease is going to call them um having it written down on the paper just simple things like that um, that can really help and then advocacy so there was a bill that was just passed um and is law now last last legislative session, um, and it's it was allowing hospitals to dispense PET. And we, I worked with um, our policy director at CCASA, Elizabeth Newman, and we found out that this was like one piece in many, many pieces of the puzzle to try to get PEP reliably to people experiencing violence. So here's, I'm just going to kind of honestly go through this quickly. So there's a lot of evidence and authorities supporting this. And when we're advocating for at our hospital level systems, when we're talking to people like pharmacists who are like, why would I break the bottle, which means opening the bottle of the expensive drug and now subjecting it to degradation and maybe having to throw it out. Why would I ever do that? Being able to say there's a lot of evidence that supports that this is good practice. Um, so this is some of the um, some of the evidence that I gathered and there's more detailed evidence um, that I've included in the PowerPoint so that you guys can um, look at it on your own time. Um, other perspectives. So there is the trauma perspective of like, this is the humane thing to do. We as a society want to be able to say that we support people who've, um, who've been subjected to violence. And right, the way that it is right now is not working. Um, and largely because of some of the trauma responses, you may not be absorbing the information trying to go from pharmacy to pharmacy, figuring out, do you give the med? Do you give, that's a lot of cognitive load. Um, and then I encourage everyone to connect with one another. Like there's a lot of secondary trauma in trying to figure this out and trying to explain why this is important, um, especially as advocates. So just seeing what other health systems, other people are doing and um, getting the, that information, I think is super helpful. I'm gonna pause, I'm doing such a bad job at pausing for questions, so I will pause. I've been following the chat. I don't think there's any questions. Um, 
there was just a, a quite a bit of updated information about minor issues. Um, I'm sorry, was there somebody who was going to ask a question? Great, and I'm gonna also add all this information to the slides at the end. Um, I think minors are tricky. Um, there's a lot of considerations around them. And if you're confused, it's normal, because again, it's a tricky situation. My recommendation is, you know, contact a SANE program at Children's or UC Health. or someone who sees children and, and ask. Um, it's it's a good way to get more information and um, has a little bit less legal jargon, but I'll definitely include it in our slides. Stories are so powerful. Um, this is the way that we move people to do the work, usually not through statistics, but saying, hey, I had a patient who had to go to three different pharmacies who had to come back to the emergency department three times to get their pills. Um, and, and it was heartbreaking and it was hard and they didn't wanna do it. Um, and this just made the whole process worse. That is really, really powerful. And writing down those stories or having those available if we needed them for a bill, for writing an op-ed, for even just talking to someone else um, is, really, is really important and meaningful. So next steps where we're going with this, um, that spreadsheet doesn't have all the same programs. I didn't get, wasn't able to connect with everyone, but I'm hoping to keep connecting. Um, the military population is a whole nother ball game. And I'd love to investigate and see how we can help, um, help over there. I know that Evans Community Hospital is going through some changes on what they're gonna offer. Um, in terms of the pills and what's stopped, looking at university student health centers and seeing um, how they can help specifically students access these medications, um, developing new advocacy tools, like do we need to do op-eds? Do we need to have a meeting where we engage all the stakeholders and try to come up with a collaborative solution? Um, and also, looking exploring options for technical assistance for health providers um a lot of primary care physicians in especially rural areas where they're the doc for everything may not feel comfortable monitoring um monitoring this drug so being able to call someone and be like hey i need help what talk this through with someone um and then looking at grants and financial support to cover drug costs um i spoke I spoke with someone, um, I, I think it was Bethany Bernal, who mentioned just having agreements between the drug manufacturers and the hospitals um, and advocating on that level. And then lastly, I think what was brought up today was uh, looking into making it very clear what the laws are around kids, what the re mandatory reporting situation is, um, and what the parent consent is, I think, it sounds like that would be really helpful to have education on that as well. Um, and we didn't look too much into explanation of benefits, but that would be another point too. Um, <clears throat> just to follow up on that, Maida, we um, I actually received some funding recently to start planning for a symposium that would engage domestic violence, sexual assault, advocacy support organizations, and those offering HIV services. So we are in the very initial stages of starting to plan for that symposium, but would absolutely love engagement from people in this group if they are interested. So please put in the chat or feel free to send either one of us an email. Um, because your your input and support would be great in moving that forward. Absolutely. Um, these are some acknowledgments. I it's just amazing how many people were so eager to help with just like a simple email of hey, I'm looking into this. Um, and just others who have 
paved the way in terms of legislation. Um, that's amazing. Um, I think the next slide is references and then the slide after that are just more detailed information. Um, if that's something that you want more access or information to, I know that all of these the slides will be sent out um, and as we get more information, I'll do my best to engage um, CICASA and the people, the list of people who attended this webinar to keep just giving information as we gather it and create it. We have about 15 minutes for questions now. Yeah, so um, I was actually thinking of the same thing. Is it possible or for Christine to unmute? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so penetrating trauma is a mandatory report for healthcare providers. And the statute is a little outdated because it um, includes gunshot wounds stabbings and ice picks, which um, we haven't seen a lot of ice picks as of recent, but um, but yes, anything penetrating is a mandatory report. Great. And since, again, we have you who is an expert, do you have any um, anything else to say about children and minors in forensic exams? So I did attack the minor consent laws um, in the chat. It's a PDF chart. Minors of any age can consent to care post-sexual offense. And um, that also includes um, sexually transmitted infection diagnosis and treatment and HIV testing and treatment. We do not need parental consent. However, if you read the entire statute, it does say that the clinician should make a reasonable attempt to notify the parent. But the difference here is that it's to notify, you are not needing to call the parent for consent. <clears throat> um, and I think Joni had a question. Does that mean that every sexual assault is a mandatory report? Um, any sexual offense to a minor is a mandatory report. Um, and then any sexual offense to an elder is a mandatory report. And in Colorado, that is 70 years old and above. In the 18 to 69 age range, it is only a mandatory report if they are having evidence collected or if they are an at-risk adult, which is our intellectually and developmentally delayed adult. Um, but if evidence is collected, it is a mandatory report in the ages of 18 to 69, and then that's where they can then choose the law, medical, or anonymous. But as the clinician, I have to mandatorily report and get my case number. It's just a matter of how much information and what I will be telling law enforcement when I make that report, if that makes sense. And then clarifying again whether this is for so someone between 18 to 69 with a penetrating wound. Mandatory report? Yeah, if somebody was shot or stabbed or any of the, the penetrating trauma, yes, that is a mandatory report for the penetrating trauma. If the, so an example, like if the 18 year old was also sexually assaulted and does not want to have evidence collected, then I do not mention anything about the sexual assault. Okay. So penetrating doesn't include 
sexual penetration. It's a wound. It has to be a wound from penetration. Right. So I, I see the confusion now that you just um, asked that. Yeah. So it's not sexual penetration. It's penetrating injury. So penetrating trauma, such as a gunshot wound or stabbing. There are reporting laws where victims can get evidence collected without a law enforcement report. Did I misunderstand what was said? Yes, there are reporting laws where victims can get evidence collected without a law enforcement report. Um, that law was was passed a few a few years ago. Um, any other questions related to, to that? clarify that um, they don't have to speak to law enforcement but I have to call and get a case number if that helps. That does. Thanks, Christine. What other questions do we have? I think we have about 10, 11 minutes. Thanks, Pamela. And thanks, Christine, for offering yourself as a as a resource. Just really appreciate it. Um, and on the lens of law enforcement, my <clears throat> understanding of that 18 to 69 age group, if there's not the penetrating injury wound, is that um, the individual who has experienced domestic violence or sexual assault along with their healthcare provider um, makes the discretionary decision to report or to pursue legal action. So it's an option for that age group. It's not mandatory. I'll put my email in the chat as well. If people um, are interested in participating in that symposium in any capacity, I would really love um, to collaborate with you. So this is my email. Please feel free to reach out. Makes me a day or so fast. Good type. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm so glad that the stats will, will be helpful. Um, speaking to Joni Owens too, she created this amazing like primary care follow-up form that you can just give to a primary care physician. Um, and it's just so streamlined. Uh, and yeah, if you're interested in that, I would definitely recommend reaching out to her and she's given me permission to share it as well. Super, super cool. Well, thank you all very much for participating. Um, we can hang out until 1130 just in case people want to talk to us privately or separately. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share our survey in the chat. If you all would be um, so kind as to fill those out. Thank you so much to our presenters and to everyone participating in the chat. Amazing, amazing resources. Thank you all again for being here. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. And 